Great stuff. Okay, we're, we're going to talk about some of these, these principles. I want to I start with the story. Do you know what? When, um, when I grew up, I don't think I've ever shared this story in church before, but, but I really wanted, I felt God said I must share this. Um, and it's going to be a bit controversial, but it's just part of my testimony. So when it's part of my testimony, it's part of my testimony. I mean, you weren't there, so keep quiet, please. Okay. You know, I grew up on a farm where... Some of you may, may, may have heard of it, that um, especially the neighboring farms, we had vineyards, we had lots of stuff, um, and, and we grew up with the dope stelsel. The dope stelsel, the, it's not the dope stel- system. It's, it's like, it was, a, it was a system that would um, give wages to people, to laborers on the farm um, by alcohol, by giving them alcohol. Um, that is probably one of the reasons why the Western Cape um, has got the highest alcohol syndrome in the world percentage, a couple of million kids. And so, so I grew up in that system, and I also grew up in a system where our family, and it came from my great-grandfather who was a born-again, spiritual believer, um, our family was used to, used to sort of be the odd ones out. Uh, and the reason for that is most, many uh, specific people would vote for a specific party, the old, which I call the National Party, and then there was another party which were more liberal type of people, but people that weren't for apartheid or any stuff. And so, so we grew up in that environment where we experienced a lot of persecution, in a sense, because certain people did not receive us as a family, or they walked down. I, I grew up in Caledon, and Caledon is a very small place. If somebody may have walked over the road and bumped their toe, then the, the rumor would be the next day that the person is half dead in the ICU, as almost bad, needed resurrection the next day, you know. <clears throat> but then it was a small bleeding toe because there's nothing happening in Caledon, and that happens every 10 minutes. Okay, so, so I grew up in this environment where many times, and especially for the neighbors, we had this, th- this wine called Fall Yapi, okay. I hope you don't know what that is. But it's very cheap wine that people made. And I used to, you know, as, as part of this system, I had to take out this wine out of these big containers and then sort of suck it like this and then put it into the small thing so that I could fill up the containers that would go out to lots of workers on the neighboring farms. And, and there I started to, to think, like, something is wrong with the system. Something is wrong with what's happening here. Um, sort of a, a thing, and I didn't know God then, but, but something started to bug me a little bit. Because my best friends were all black. I mean, still, I've got three best friends. One is white, one is black, and I don't know what you call a Pakistani, but he's like all over the place. Okay, so he's a Pakistani guy. And um, <clears throat> so, so I used to sit around the table, and, 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 and color was never an issue and all that stuff. I'm not going to talk about racism. I'm just, just talking about God's restoration and the way we should see things. And so, so coming even to school, I realized, but there are people that think differently. You know, and I would always stand up and say, so almost be the odd one out and say, look, look here, you know, uh, black people actually have souls. They're not all going to hell. They're not the Gentiles in the Old Testament and a lot of stuff. But that was sort of, lots of people put a label because, you know, the apartheid theory says, said that, that uh, and it was born out of the theology department here, um, that black people can't go to heaven. Uh, that was simply what, what it said. Um, and so, so going through these processes was a massive challenge. But uh, then when I came to high school, I started to realize, well, there are actually other people that think in the same way, and they're not full of hatred, because I, I saw the one part on this side, people that have got hatred for this group, and that part has got hatred for that group. And, and the one thing I recognized by all of these people is the fact that there was such a bitterness and the anger from where they came. Something was stolen from them. They, they lost something inside. They, they, they let them, their past or what's happening around them, that was the thing that drove them. And then I committed my life to Christ and became, you know, spirit-filled. And I started to see the world through another, some other eyes. And, and then, I, then I started to realize, but there's some people that don't like what I'm doing. You know, um, I had a friend that walked up to me and said to me, if you get baptized, I will not be your friend anymore. I, I, will, I will not be your friend. I will never talk to you again. And the next week I got baptized and he never spoke to me again. Three years, you know. And I, and I realized, but 
what's happening? I'm, I've, I've got now an uh, opportunity to either be offended and, and sort of be nasty with him, and, and when he doesn't see, throw him with a piece of cake or whatever, you know? <coughs> or, I, or, or I can understand that, that all of this, all this world, this wickedness that we're in, I can say to God, God, you are bigger than what I'm experiencing, what's going around, I'm going to look to you. And, and that's sort of how my life started with God when I was in grade eight. And, and, and from there on, God started to do a lot of stuff. And I believe tonight God wants to heal some of our hearts here. God, God wants to, to do something in your spirit because I truly believe that this, on, on the campus here, this is the time for the church to stand up. This is the time for us to stand up, not because we're proud or we're fighting anything, just simply because we really have the answer. We can say Jesus is the answer. Can somebody say amen? Okay. So, so, so don't be intimidated. The rumors are probably going to get worse. People are going to probably try to be, why? Because the devil is getting very tense about what we have to offer. The devil is get, getting very tense about what's happening in your life. I want to start with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. You know, the reason why we come to God tonight is simply because He's holy. And a couple of months ago, the Lord said to me something that changed me profoundly. It was probably one of the, the, the biggest things that impacted me. It was just like two months ago, just when we came out of the mountains in India. The Lord said to me, as I was worshiping Him, the Lord said to me this, very simple. He said to me, but it's very profound, it was very profound for me. He said, see us, you can worship me because I am the only unselfish or selfless being that you will ever know. Even the devil comes to you because he wants something from you. He wants your soul. The devil wants something. The demons, the, the stuff, the people around you, everybody that you know and every being that you know has got an agenda when it comes to a relationship with you except God. He's unselfish in nature because he's perfect. And I realized, well, I can worship him. I can come to him because he's holy. He's different. He's separate. He's not like any other created thing. You know, and some people say, well, they just discovered this other ape thing. I just say, hallelujah, I don't come from that stuff. That guy is too ugly, you know. Vrachis, you know. Let them believe what they believe, but vrachis, that, that thing, I don't, I don't, that's not my forefathers. I mean, you know. I look a bit more fancy and beautiful than that stuff. I mean, come on, don't you neighbor and say, hey, God says you're beautiful. <laughs> okay, so pursue peace and holiness with all men. I used to think that pursuing peace means I need to be nice with everybody. Pursuing peace, you know, there's a difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. A peacekeeper is somebody that just always says, I, I, I want to avoid confrontation because I don't like confrontation, and I just want peace, but that's a false peace. A peacemaker is somebody that walks onto the platform and can be able to speak truth in love and say, hey, this is what God wants in your life. So sometimes a peacemaker is somebody that confronts. <laughs> somebody that tells you, hey, there is a heaven and a hell. Whether you believe it or not, but there's a place of accountability in your life. And you do it with all the love in your heart. But you know what? We're not going to back down. Too many Christians are backing down on the truth. They are compromising. We're going to look at that a little bit later. Okay. So I'm going to look at three characters in the Bible. Three people that God used in the most, circum in the, most the, the worst circumstances probably where everybody around them withdrew. Everybody around them had an opinion Everybody around them wanted to force them to be feel intimidated or victimized by their circumstances. Do you know through the Supreme Court and through things that is happening and just happened a month ago or three weeks ago in America, you know, everybody has redefined marriage. Everybody is redefining God's institution, tries to redefine the church. The, the, the Western society is on the verge of great collapse. Every society that has started to mix and start, try to redefine God's institution of church and God's institution of marriage would soon fall. 
But there was also some societies, the Christian communities that would stand up and they would bring the truth in love and great revivals would come. We're on the verge of South Africa either going down the drain or a group of Christians says, we will humble ourselves before God. We will become holy. The more people say, you know, I had a lady says, oh, you were in the newspaper the other day and, and you were a bit, the Afrikaans were, it's actually a lady that phoned me from Caledon, you're a bit conservative these days. How can you be so conservative to tell people that they shouldn't sleep together with their girlfriend or their boyfriend before they get married? What age are you from? I said, I'm from the Bible age. Amen. Amen. I thought this, but I didn't say it. I wanted to say it to a lady. I didn't say this, but I thought it. I'm just confessing, just between the two of us. But this is what I wanted to say. I wanted to say, lady, you'll be gone and the Bible will still be here. But I didn't say it, praise God. I mustered all the love in my heart. Okay, so listen to this. So with the first guy we're going to look at, is the first two people is Joshua and Caleb. And I love these two characters because there was something just in their hearts. The question is, if you want to be a leader, if you want to walk onto the platform of life, take responsibility, not be passive anymore, but stand up in the place of the calling of God on your life, forgetting those things that lies behind and stretching yourself to the utter call of God, the utmost call of God in Jesus Christ, is, is some people that are they're running the race. And they're going to finish that race. Listen to Numbers 13, verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him and said, this is the spies that have gone up. Joshua and Caleb have come back with the other spies. We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. The question is, who are you? <laughs> These spies came back. And 10 of the 12 spies said the following. They said, look here, this promised land is full of massive giants. When you walk on campus here, you're going to face a lot of spiritual, emotional giants that you need to overcome. And you can run away and be intimidated like these other spies because they says, look here, because we saw ourselves like this, we were also like that in their eyes. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a son of God? Or do you see yourself as an orphan? Do you see yourself as somebody that Jesus was clean, forgiven, and you can stand there? It doesn't matter what people say about you. You can say, I'm a son of God. He determines who I am. I go to the Bible, not to my friends, not to the fear of man. They can't tell me who I am. They have not created. They're all created beings. There's only one creator that has made me. And when I come to him, I can say, oh, thank you, Jesus. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives inside of me. I am his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that I should walk in them. Whatever and whoever has been born of God has overcome this world. You see, I always thought as a Christian, especially when I got saved, I thought like when you come to Jesus, all your troubles is going to fade away. Jesus is the happy-go-lucky God. So all you do is you sit there and you pray and say, oh, thank you, Jesus. And then the first calamity strikes your family or it strikes your neighborhood or it strikes you. And then suddenly you think like, where's Jesus in all of this? It's that moment when you stand up and say, God, I don't understand what's happening, but I've got your peace in my life. You see, we live in a broken world. People around you are going to make decisions that's going to hurt you. That's going to, some of your family members are going to say stuff over you and me, and it's going to happen to you. We live in a sinful world, and that is part of your promised land. That's where you need to find the giants in between the giants. How are you going to see yourself? So many people say, oh, God, when I come to you, just remove all the troubles. God says, no, you must. You stand in front of your mountain and you speak to your mountain. You stand in front of that giant and say, like, like 
David, I don't come to you in my own strength, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the hosts of the army of heaven. Amen. Some of you need to wake up to who you are. Hello. Did you know Ben say, hello. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, just, it's just amazing. Okay. The second question we need to ask ourselves, first, who are you? The second one is, who do you follow? I love this about Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> Numbers 32, verse 12. Listen to this. Except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the king is his right, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Don't call your children that, okay? It's not going to be an easy time for them at school. Okay. That's not going to be a blessing, although this name may mean a blessing. But, but don't say Kinezazite. Okay, whatever. For they have wholly followed the Lord. That's what I love about Joshua and Caleb. You know, every time when Moses came from the mountain or Moses came out of the tent, Scripture says Joshua and Caleb was there, especially Joshua. They didn't just mingle with the people. That, that's a picture of mingling with the world and then letting the world decide who you are. And who you should follow. But the scripture says, yeah, they wholly followed the Lord. Wholly followed the Lord. Their whole heart. And you know, God will never ask you to do something that he will not give you the capacity to do. That he has not done himself. That's why Jesus should be your best friend. That's why you have to look at him every day and say, God, what an example. That's why I love Jesus so much. Because do you know what? He's perfect. Full of love. And a perfect, he was, he was, he was the, the pure heart of God towards us. See, but also if you're a leader, the third thing is you need to, like God said to Joshua, Joshua, if you were going to go into this promised land, there's massive giants. I love David on this one side. David, when he, when he said that against Goliath, he ran, he struck Goliath. Goliath fell dead and then he cut off the, the Goliath's head as well. Dead, deader, dead stuff. When it's sure, sure nobody's going to resurrect you, buddy. You know? But, <clears throat> you know, th there's a lot of people whose strength are failing them at this time. A lot of Christians. Oh, the devil is so big. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and courageous. Three times God says it to him. <clears throat> that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. So God comes to Joshua. He's, at the beginning of Joshua chapter 1, he says to, to uh, Joshua, Joshua, Moses is dead. Moses is dead. That season is over. And you know, a, a good leader is somebody that can change and grow all the time. Because sometimes you must realize Moses is dead. I need to let go of the past. I need to let go of that stuff that haunts me. I need to say, Moses, you are dead. You're not going to make it into the promised land. But you know what? I've got strength and courage. And listen to this in Numbers 14. When it comes to, we're talking about this leadership, this ability. And the world is looking for godly men and women to stand up and to say, when everybody else sees the bad stuff, when everybody else sees South Africa is going down, when everybody else has got an opinion, we focus on God's opinion. And we listen to what God says first. Listen to this, Numbers 14, verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed. This is what God says about Caleb. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit. It's all about inheritance, about a birthright. Are you willing to let go of everything else because you realize you've got a spiritual birthright? There's something God has laid out for us as a church, for you as an individual. And you need to say, God, I want my birthright. I'm not going to let the devil accuse and bring all the shame and all the guilt and all the nonsense. Because you know what? God doesn't speak like this. Oh, you're so bad. Oh, you're never going to make it. Oh, you're... When that finger points at you, you must know it's the accuser of the brethren. And he accuses you day and night before God and before yourself. That's what he did to Jesus. He says, Jesus, if you are the son of God, then do the will of God in another way than what you know is the will of God. Try a shortcut. 
In the kingdom of God, there is no shortcuts. There is only God's will. And he is faithful. But listen to this. Caleb had an excellent spirit, some translation says. He had a different spirit. There was something that was inside of him, alive inside of him. Now, I want you to go to this because I, uh, this is probably one of my favorite scriptures next to the other 3,000 in the Bible. Joshua 14, verse 10. Now, now you must, I'm going to draw the picture, okay? Joshua and Caleb stood there. They're going to go into the promised land. They say, come on, people, let's go up. Let's go in. All the other spies says, no, 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 no. Giants. Everybody, fear comes upon them. Everybody says, no, 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 no. Then God says, okay, it's not going to work. You can't get into the promised land if you're full of fear, if you're double-minded, if you're confused. Because the fear is going to kill you. It's going to open doors to kill you. So all I'm going to do is I'm actually going to be nice to you people. You are going to stay behind in the wilderness. And you're going to die there. And you're going to go. But you're never going to taste the birthright that God has that I've laid out for you. So what happens is they go all around. And then they come back again. And now the only people left after many years in the desert, in the wilderness, they come back to the same place again. And Joshua and Caleb is standing in front of the promised land again. Now they have a choice again. That's what I love about God. God will, even if you've made the worst mistakes in your life, He will restore. He will always bring you back to that same place. And then He says, look here, we've got an opportunity to start all over again. You may think, well, you've wasted 20 years. No, no, you haven't wasted anything. And God, God isn't fixed by time. And there's some of you that think that you are too bad, that God can use you. You've wasted your life and all of that stuff. I've got good news for you. God is here tonight. And He's going to restore because restoration is different than just giving you back what you, the position that you were in. Think of the prodigal son. The prodigal son just got money the first time around. The second time when he came back, because his heart changed, the father gave him a ring, a robe, and shoes. The father didn't give him that the first time. And also money. And a fatted calf. Huh? What a bargain. 